Megan Henvey is going to introduce us to this whole subject. And uh, Megan is a, a doctor, and um, she's got a PhD from, in the history of art from York University, which she got in 2020. Uh, congratulations on that. <laughs> <laughs> and um, she, she's, a, she's a local, so in fact, uh, she grew up in uh, Ard Glass, I think I'm correct in thinking. So just came down the, well, she didn't just come down the road because she <laughs> lives in Leeds and flew over uh, to, back to see us. So it's great to have her back. And she did a PhD on the High Crosses of Northern Ireland uh, with an a HRC grant and looked at all of the iconography and the context and the, particularly the geology, uh, which is a, a, a great new area of study uh, for the High Crosses of Northern Ireland and has produced a number of publications as a result of that. But today she's going to talk to us about the Carndonagh Cross in Donegal um, and uh, the history and iconography and the theological context of this and also the geological evidence because this is very important. And through that, she's going to give us some new ideas about the development of the form of the High Cross in Ireland and in Britain. So we're looking forward to this. So welcome, Megan. And uh, I'll just come down. There we are. So we don't, nobody trips over. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Mike. Um, can everybody hear me OK? No? I can hear myself echoing, but maybe I... Lower the back, lower the mic down. This one? Oh. Is, that, is that better? Can I be...? Great. All right. Thank you. Um, so, yes, thanks for having me. It's a, it's a pleasure to be in my homelands to, to speak about the High Crosses. Um, it was Mike's work on the Downpatrick Cross that got me uh, interested in this area all those years ago, uh, so thank you for that. And, and now it's, uh, it's work that's ongoing, so that's good. Um, I have enjoyed this morning's discussions of the form and practice of creating all these different um, interlacing Celtic arts. Um, but it is, as Mike has said, from a slightly different angle that I hope to consider the, this type of art today. Um, I, to these observations and reflections that you've all offered this morning, I'm hoping to show how, as an art historian, um, I would look at individual examples in order to develop an understanding of the influences used, adapted and built upon by medieval artists and also what meanings might be behind these carefully constructed works of art. Um, before I start, um, I would like just to take a very brief moment to pay tribute to Dr Peter Harbison who has passed away recently. Um, he was, many of us in the audience I'm sure will be familiar with his very important works. He was a pillar of our academic community. Um, and without many of his works, in particular his uh, magnum opus, the High Crosses of Ireland, an iconographical and photographic survey, really very, very little of the research that I and others do on these High Crosses would ever have been possible. So it's important before I start to have taken a moment to uh, show gratitude to him. So, Turning then to the subject of my paper, the date of the Carndona Cross um, in County Donegal has been hotly debated by scholars over a very long period. It has been variably assigned an early, middle or late chronological position in an imagined series of high cross production in Ireland. Francoise Henri, who was a preeminent scholar of early medieval Irish art and culture, who enjoyed a distinguished career lecturing at University College Dublin, saw the Cardona Cross as a transition monument type between stones with ca crosses carved on them, which were typically believed to have been one of the earliest forms of Christian sculpture on the island from about the 5th century, and the proper, in inverted commas, carved and ringed Celtic high crosses, which are usually dated to between the 9th and 11th centuries. And so she dated the Carndona cross to the 8th century, so about in the middle. However, later, Peter Harbison uh, dated the cross to the first quarter of the 9th century based on iconographic comparisons, with weight added to that by the historical investigations of Brian Lacey. Meanwhile, Robert Stevenson, whose work I'm sure is familiar to many in the audience as well, saw this cross as part of a later and wider Celto-Scandinavian artistic culture 
that shared influences and elements with Viking, Northern Britain and the Isle of Man. Thus, the central problems associated with investigation of the Carndona Cross surround its date and the reason for and influences upon its production. And this is where I'm hoping that the artists among you will indulge me this afternoon in a, a foray into history. Um, so to deal with these issues, I will in turn uh, cover each of the points that are on this slide, hopefully. Um, first, I will reconsider the history of the site before newly contextualising the cross in terms of its geology and the style and iconography of the carvings. And by situating the Carndona Cross within its wider Celtic and early medieval European historical, artistic and theological contexts, we will then be able to conclude by proposing a date for its production. So, the tripartite life of Patrick, a text which is believed to have been written through the 9th to mid 10th centuries, includes a reference to a place by the name of Donachmore MacToher. And based on the descriptions in that text of geographical features and surrounding place names, Donachmore MacToher has been traced reliably to the modern village of Carndona in County Donegal. And that text also recounts then that Patrick there founded a Christian community, had erected a church and stayed for 40 days. Nothing of this story is recorded in any other existing text. So setting aside questions surrounding the truthfulness of the account given in the tripartite life, what we can extrapolate are two important points from this reference. First is that when this text was written in the 9th to mid 10th centuries, there was a Christian community at Carndona. And second, also at this same date, it was either already believed or the writer or writers wanted it now to be believed that this Christian community had been established by Patrick in the fifth century. And it is worth noting here that forging or reinforcing connections with historical saints was an important way that medieval Christian communities would seek to boost their own reputation. Quite simply, the more ancient the site's claimed or real origins and the greater the saint involved, the bigger the kudos and with that prestige comes pilgrims and prosperity. So that could be what has happened here in the writing of this text. A community established at any time before the date of writing could, through the very writing of the text, be seeking to improve their standing by associating themselves with the person of Patrick. And if this is the case, this development of reputation in the 9th to 10th centuries may also have been the impetus for the material development of the site at Carndona, including the production of the High Cross for use by the growing numbers of pilgrims and churchgoers at the site. And given that this association with Patrick was known from at least the date of the tripartite life was written, there is another textual record that has been considered to possibly indicate the foundation date of the site and cross at Carndona. While not mentioning Carndona explicitly, the Annals of Early Ireland record in the 730s that the Kennel Owen family, which was one of the most important dynasties in the Inish Owen Peninsula, established an alliance with the primary patrician community at Armagh. It may have been this moment that they established also a patrician community at Carndona, and that may also have included the, the building of, and production of decorative works such as the cross. Overall then, the limited textual evidence doesn't provide anything comfortably conclusive but it does point to possible dates for the Cardona Cross in the 730s when the Kennel Owen formed an alliance with Patrick's community and which at Armagh and so may have uh, built the site then or at some point in the 9th to mid 10th centuries when the association with Patrick is first written of and perhaps indicating a period of both reputation and actual building at the site. So essentially these are two moments in time when we know there was some interest in the site which may have occasioned the making of the cross. And so, of course, this is where I think, um, as an art historian, the fun starts. As we turn to the cross itself, um, 
As an art historian, it's my practice to look at the cross, look at the objects, and to think about the ways in which it itself can tell us about the people that made it and what they might have used it for, and crucially for today, uh, the date that it might have been made. So as previously noted, Francois Henri pointed to the sculptures of the Inishowen Peninsula as key in the development of the High Cross as a monument type. At nearby Fahan Mura, the carved stone cross, uh, the carved stone bears a cross, there's a cross carved on it, and it has small projections at the arms, and I've circled one here on the left, you can just see it, um, so that the, it appears that the sculptor intended for the stone itself to take on the form of a cross. So rather than simply having a cross carved on the stone using the line incised method, as in these examples from St. Berhert's Kyle, at Fahan Mura, the sculptor was playing with the idea of carving a cross out of the stone. And it is in this sense that Henri believed that the nearby Carndona cross, and I quote, marked the final victory in the attempt to free the cross from the slab, end quote, thus considering it the earliest and first of the freestanding high crosses. But as I said in the introduction, this chronology has not been unanimously accepted. Although there have also been other attempts to sequence Ireland's early medieval carved stone cross monuments. And these have also resulted in the unringed form and shallow carvings of the Carndona cross being dated to an early phase. However, in 2019, Ian Meehan and I undertook the first geological survey of the crosses in the north of Ireland the results of which do problematise this rationale for the early dating of the Carndona Cross. And I will be very pleased to hear from any sculptors in the audience their thoughts on what's about to come next. Dorothy Kelly suggested that the characteristics of stone available for monumental carving may have dictated some aspects of a monument's design and form. And a bit like Aidan said earlier too, I suppose, um, uh, a mistake or a flaw becomes a feature. In this light, uh, it is the observation of the geology of the Carndona Cross um, can reveal new insights. So on our survey, what we discovered was that the Carndona Cross is carved from a rather poor quality, medium grained grey sandstone with mudstone lenses on the east face, which in the bottom left corner are peeling away to reveal a reddened mudstone layer in the underneath bedding plane. On the narrow faces, the layers of the stone, um, which are known as bedding, are irregular and rather visible. And you can see just about that's the top of the head of a figure. And there's an almond shaped eye just there as well. You can see a sort of little pointed beard. But you can see that it's obscured because of these, these la layers of the bedding. Um, and that must have rendered carving very difficult. And indeed, the figures on the south face, um, they are obscured while they're even further more uh, prominent, these bedding planes, on the north, north face, making it unclear but unlikely that it did ever uh, bear any carving. So the use of shallow carving techniques on the broad east and west faces and the avoidance altogether of carving decorative motifs on the north face where the bedding is most prominent suggests that the planning and carving of the Carndona Cross was undertaken by the designer or sculptor with the limitations of the rock in mind. Thus, the style of carving does not necessarily reflect naivety, but was the result of deliberate choices that reveal a sophisticated understanding of how best to work with the features and flaws of this quarried piece of stone. So to this end, the Carndona Cross really might have been made in any period. And I'm aware that as, as yet, you may be wondering exactly what carvings I am talking about. And so that's what I will now turn to. So turning to the specifics of the style of the carvings themselves, there are two key aspects that we can explore here before turning to um, further iconographic analysis of the programme. And first, we're going to look at the interlaced carvings and then the types of the figures carved. So on the west face, uh, it is filled with a distinctive triple ribbon forming an interlaced cross. And my sketched over version on the right um, might help to make this more prominent just for the purposes of the big screen. I thought that was helpful. Um, 
And there is also a hole bored into the centre of the cross head, um, possibly where a panel of metal, glass or a precious gem might have been affixed. Um, and there are many here, obviously, more <laughs> expertly equipped than I to talk about the specifics of the form and methods of production of this particular interlaced design. So I am going to sidestep that discussion to focus on the fact that it is a triple banded ribbon. And this type of ribbon is only found in Ireland um, at nearby Fahan and on a fragment at St. Magdara's Island in County Galway. But taking a wider cross-regional view, it is more common in the early medieval sculptural and manuscript arts of Britain. For example, the circa 700 Book of Duro, the early 10th century unfinished Book of Deer, and the 10th century Ardchat and Cross Slab in Argyll, Scotland. This three-part ribbon is more commonly used also in the depiction of serpents as at Ardchatton. And this is not a coincidence, and you can, I've just circled the serpent's head there. Um, it's not a coincidence that this should be, that this three-part ribbon would have been used in the depiction of serpents. Um, in Christianity, the number three holds an important meaning. It references the Trinity of God the Father together with his son, Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit. So depicting serpents, the animal that led Adam and Eve to commit the first sin in a form that references this holy trinity is a very concise and clever way of expressing the unity of the Old and New Testaments. Here at Carndona, the trinity recalling three-part form of the ribbon is arranged into the form of a cross, which itself points to a specific symbolism the belief in the Trinity's presence at the crucifixion. This was a theology early developed and crucially is attested in texts written in early medieval Ireland, for example, St. Patrick's Confessio. And uh, for those of us who aren't Latinists in the room, I'll read the English, um, but the rest of you can enjoy yourselves with what's on the screen. Um, he conquered death and was received up into heaven to the Father and he gave him all power over every name of things in heaven and on earth and under the earth, that every tongue should confess to him that Jesus Christ is Lord and God, in whom we believe, and we look to his imminent coming as judge of the living and the dead, who will render to each one according to his deeds. And he poured out on us abundantly his Holy Spirit, the gift and pledge of immortality, who makes those who believe and obey to be sons of God and heirs alone with Christ. Him we confess and worship as one God in the Trinity of sacred name, end quote. So I give this quote to show that this belief was present in early medieval Ireland and therefore we can reliably interpret this carving on the Cardona cross in this way as referencing the Trinity. The second stylistic aspect of the cross to consider is the depiction of human figures and so I have got the, um, the figure on the left, south face here again with his, his little um, pointed beard and his arms you can see crossed here before him. And those are the two same images I've just again sketched over it so that sort of to help um, pick out the details. And then we'll come to this one again shortly. Um, but for now I'm just looking at the, this, the way in which these human figures are carved. So in the east and south faces, um, these figures are carved with, in uh, static and hierat uh, hieratically, featuring large almond-shaped eyes and rectangular noses. And accepting the larger and central figure, this one here, on the upper east face, all also wear garments to the ankle that enclose their bodies and arms. And perceived as unsophisticated, naive and even hesitant, these figures have contributed to an understanding of an early date for the Cardona cross. However, comparison with figural depictions in stone carving and manuscripts elsewhere in the insular world demands reconsideration of this. This same means of depicting a figure's facial features is found in the Irish context infrequently and in localised areas. It features again at f nearby Fahan Mura and at Caramore, also on the Inishowen Peninsula, as well as at Ullard in Kilkenny. And there are some similarities to be identified in the carvings at Moon in Kildare as well. 
However, these static, flat-nosed, large-eyed figures are more recognisable from the corpus of extant carved stones in Scotland, and therefore perhaps point to connections across the islands of the insular world. Interestingly, they appear alongside the triple ribbon interlace design we have already discussed on the 10th century Ardchatton Cross slab and in the Book of Deer, which thus might suggest a similar date for the Cardona Cross and possibly the sharing of artistic influences across all three. Furthermore, in the Irish context, reusing the artistic traditions of earlier periods, in particular those associated with the period of the site or community's foundation, was a common practice. The simplistic decorative motifs in the Book of Deer have been discussed as intentionally emulating the earlier Irish tradition, and the same might be said of the Cardona Cross. So, so far, investigation of the site's history and the cross's geology and style of carvings have suggested a variety of possible dates for the cross. Based on texts, when the period, uh, the period when links with the patrician community at Armagh were being developed, so either the 730s or the 9th to mid 10th century, or on the evidence of style, perhaps at a time when this connection was being reinforced later in the 10th century. So, turning to the iconography then, uh, the identity and meaning of the figural scheme on the east face of the cross in particular. And we're going to get into some uh, quite some detail here. So there is a large central figure, haloed and um, wearing a long sleeved garment which comes to the knee and he has his arms outstretched in an asymmetrical pose and is flanked by figures below and above his arms who do not carry any attributes or wear a distinctive clothing or hairstyle. This is an ambiguous scheme and has been identified as either the crucifixion or Christ in glory. Consideration of the key elements of the scheme, the Oran's pose of arms outstretched, a typical prayer mode even today, the flanking figures above and below the arms and the three in the panel below point to a complex identification intended to call to mind the fullness of Christ's salvation offering life, death and resurrection. And I'll go into those details then. So focusing on the raised right arm as an act of blessing, Francois Henri identified the scheme as Christ in glory. However, this and analogous schemes of the Magistus Domini, Last Judgment and the Second Coming is typically found on the cross head of Irish high crosses and in a specific arrangement as shown here on the Arbo and Muradax crosses. In these, Christ stands centrally with one or both of the foliate scepter and cross held over his shoulders and the bird representing the Holy Spirit above his head. Meanwhile, at Cardona, the central figure of Christ is in the Oran's pose and does not hold any attributes um, and is flanked by those figures. And there's also isn't a bird at Cardona. So it seems that, that another explanation could be more likely. In both, early medieval, in, in both early Christian and early medieval Irish depictions of the crucifixion, there are examples of Christ crucified and holding the prayerful Oran's pose. And it is important to note that the early theology surrounding the crucifixion emphasised Christ's victory over death, as set out in a text that was circulating in, early, in Ireland in the early Middle Ages, um, that is Bede's De Tabernaculo. I'll have some more Latin, that we confess the death of the humanity assumed by our Lord in such a way that we acknowledge that the same humanity immediately rose again from death into eternal glory. And this was translated into the iconography by minimising reference to the cross and wounds and depicting Christ alive, open-eyed and in a strong priestly Oran's pose as even on the earliest known depiction of the crucifixion, that is the 430 to 432 Santa Sabina doors in Rome. In the insular context, this pose is preserved in the crucifixion in the 8th century Durham Gospels, the 10th, 10th to early 11th century Southampton Psalter, 
and on Irish high crosses, including the early 9th century Downpatrick cross, with which we will all be much more familiar in the next hour or so, and the possibly 10th century Castle Dermot South cross. Thus, the Orans pose at Carndona, even with the asymmetry of one arm being slightly higher than the other, can be identified as depicting the crucified Christ in a manner found across Britain and Ireland uh, from the 8th to 11th centuries, and is known in Irish sculptural contexts from, a, uh, from at least the early 9th century. So turning to the static and attributeless flanking figures who stand on the same level as Christ and look towards him, these are difficult to identify. And possibilities include the soldiers Stephaton and Longinus, although they do not carry the sponge and spear as is typical in early medieval Irish sculpture. Or they could be Mary and John the Evangelist, who were popularly depicted in Anglo-Saxon England, but are not found elsewhere in the Irish material, which makes this somewhat unlikely. Or, as Harbison suggested, they might represent the good and bad thief. And the worn carvings above their heads might have been the bird pecking at the bad thief and the angel accompanying the good. This arrangement would be unique as although these characters do appear in some Irish cross crucifixion schemes, they are always in the arms of the stone cross and depicted as upon the cross of their own crucifixion, not standing and looking at Christ. So depicted without attributes, or perhaps with attributes that were changeable through the application of paint, it seems possible that these two flanking figures were intentionally ambiguous. They could at once be Longinus and Stephaton, Mary and John, and the good and bad thieves. Their stylized form strips them of identity, and being entirely depersonalized, they can be interpreted as anyone. Indeed, the function of Mary and John the Evangelist in the Anglo-Saxon examples was to act as witnesses to the event of the crucifixion. Here, these figures without attribute might be best understood in the same way, acting for the viewer before the stone cross, such as ourselves, as models of the compunction required to look upon the crucified and risen Christ. The identically dressed and also attributeless row of three figures in profile looking to the left that appear underneath this scheme of the crucifixion might be understood as fulfilling the same function. <coughs> Thus, regardless their identity, these five figures are bearing witness to Christ's death at the crucifixion and his glorious resurrection in a manner typical to post 9th century insular depictions of the crucifixion. And turning very briefly to the figures above Christ's arms, they're squeezed into the spur space in the typical fashion of angels at the crucifixion on Irish crosses. These angels historicize the depiction in that in the Middle, Angel, Middle Ages, angels were understood to have been present at the crucifixion. But more importantly, this also facilitated a widespread belief that they were also present at divine services. And a text known to have been circulating in the insular world, and I'm sorry, this is the last Latin lesson, Gregory the Great did outline this forcefully. Which of the faithful can have any doubt that at the moment of the immolation, at the voice of the priest, the heavens were opened, that in the mystery of Jesus Christ, the choirs of angels are present, the lowest are bound to the highest, the earthly are joined with the heavenly, and out of the visible and the invisible, a union is created. This passage importantly elucidates not only that the inclusion of the angels emphasizes Christ's divine nature, but crucially that the angels provide a model for contemplation of that divinity, colleagues to man in prayer, and reinforcing the theme of witness. Thus, onlookers are encouraged to witness, as angels and the flanking and lower figures do, 
and adopt the prayerful Oran's pose in emulation of Christ depicted before them, to raise their gaze and look and meditate with compunction upon the interlaced cross in the head above. So, drawing to a conclusion. The textual evidence is limited to one mention of the site in the tripartite life of Patrick and supplemented by references in the annals. These suggest two possible dates for the cross, the first in the 730s when an alliance between the Kenelowen family and the patrician community at Armagh was established, perhaps giving rise to the establishment of a satellite community in Kenelowen lands at Carndonagh. And secondly, the 9th to mid 10th century when the tripartite life of Patrick, which references the community, was written. Analysis of the rock's geology, which includes prominent bedding planes on the narrow faces, has here demonstrated that the shallow, line incised method was likely an intelligent choice as the sculptor worked with the stone that had been provided to them. As such, the cross could have been made in any period. Furthermore, the stylized, static way in which the human figures are carved has typically been understood as indicating an early date for the cross. However, it has been shown here that this style of carving figures is found on other later 10th century monuments and manuscripts in Britain. But, and perhaps even more crucially, it is in the 10th century context that this figure type is paired with the distinctive triple banded ribbon as at Carndonna. Meanwhile, the iconographic programme reflects beliefs surrounding the presence of the Trinity and Christ's salvation offering victory at the crucifixion. Beliefs which are attested in texts known to have been circulating in Ireland in the early Middle Ages and which are preserved in the iconography of the crucifixion on Irish high crosses into the 10th century. And we'll be able to see this in person um, in the Downpatrick Cross just this afternoon. So overall, situating the Carndon Cross within the historical, artistic, and theological contexts of the wider Celtic, insular, and early medieval European worlds suggests that it was not a transition monument representing the first cross breaking free from the stone. Instead, all the evidence um, taken together has suggested that it was likely made in the 10th century, that is, long after the form of the freestanding cross had been established, and that historical techniques were deliberately employed both as a response to the features and flaws of the stone and, the, and in accordance with the requirements of the community that commissioned and used it. Thank you. Yes. Very no, I, I can't see a thing, so I don't see any questions. I'll just go. Yeah. <laughs> um, has this cross been uh, standing all along, or was it uh, fallen down and re-erected at some point? It, it, it's very weathered, but is it, uh, or, or do we know? We don't know. It's certainly not in its original location. If you've been to Carndonna, it's um, in a, uh, sort of under a little purpose-built shell um, shed. So it's certainly not in its original location. And in fact, I think given where the peeling sort of comes to about here, I think it has actually been underground at least to that point at some stage. I see. Um, but it's certainly been moved, and yes, it has had a lot of weathering. I'll pass over to Cynthia after I finish with you. So, um, oh dear, I'm <laughs> sounds ominous. <laughs> no, that, that was brilliant and really, really thought provoking. Did you uh, compare it to the Camus Cross in Angus? I, yes, yeah, yeah. It's, there's some similar similarities there in terms of the form of the stone as yeah, well. Yeah, the form of the stone and the imagery as well with the, yeah. the, the, the angels up above. It, it sits yeah. just outside my village. Oh, right. Yeah. In, in, in Maniki. Yeah. Um, looking at that shape of stone, uh, I'm a stone carver, so it's uh, it's, it's certainly much uh, easier to carve it, you know, with mm. those those nicely sloping arms. <laughs> and obviously what, what we can't see is what was taken away. Um, what, what does the socket look like? Do we know what it looks like Say underground? Say it again, sorry? What, what does the socket it sits in look like? 
I, do, I don't know, and right. it's certainly it um, won't be the original either, I wouldn't have thought. No, it's just that the Camus Cross um, it, it is the same width underground as the arms are, which makes it quite Oh, I see. Quite oh yes, of course yeah. it is. Yeah, yeah. It's the only one I can think of that, that, mm. that, that's like that in, in Scotland. Mm. Um, that, that delamination, I mean, I don't think that's really that bad a piece of stone, and, and that delamination probably wasn't even visible you know, when they were when they were using it. And uh, as a piece of medium grained, flat bedded sandstone, it, 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 it's doing all right. If it was worse, I'd expect those faces to have delaminated and spalled off uh, a yeah. long time ago. But yeah. Um, yeah, that was brilliant. Thank you. Thank you. I'll hand you over to <laughs> Cynthia. I'll just say, I think that is the one of the key points there is that, because it's, and I'm not sure how much of a sense of the scale you get. Can you hear me now? I've moved yeah, away from yeah, the mic so fine. that I'm not in the, I, I can actually see you all. Um, the, it's it's probably about eight foot tall or more. Anybody that's been can can correct me. Um, so my idea is this suggestion that such a large piece of stone, once safely quarried and moved to a place where it can be carved, the sculptor is going to do what they can with it because uh, quite a lot of work's already taken place at that point. If that makes sense, that's sort of the idea I'm working on there. Um. Okay. <laughs> I was struck by the stylistic similarity of the marching or processing rather figures and the marching soldiers on the Dublin yeah. cross from Dunning um, and that cross commemorating the particular Pictish king, presumably Constantine, son of Fergus. Mm -hmm. And I really hope I'm not getting my Pictish kings confused and I might be and if I am, please ignore me. <laughs> but I, I think he, m uh, I'm, not, I'm citing someone else's scholarship, but he may have, the Picts were sort of overlords of of Western Scotland, Dalriada, in in that part of the ninth century, and he, ins I think he installed his son hmm. over in the west, or one of his sons. And I was wondering if, I guess this would be one degree of separation. If there's, r is there any written evidence for links between kindreds or churches from Condonna in Dalriada in Western Scotland that would be, yeah, like one degree of separation between these two stones. Yeah, well, that, that would be the next stage of this sort of research, I suppose. But one thing that's interesting, um, certainly in this region, so in the initial one peninsula, the other important thing to note is um, it's where Colm Kill was came from. And of course, Iona is just basically a hop over the water at that point. So those sorts of connections across into the northern Britain um, are certainly there. And the historical side of it is a next thing to explore. So it's a great point, thank you. Thanks, Megan, that was a brilliant piece. Thank so you. just going quite specifically, you had mentioned that there was a small hole in the middle mm. of the cross. Yeah. Um, would that, in your research, would that have been very specific to Carn this Carndona cross, or did you come across that um, in other places and other crosses that you looked at? And did you find any evidence in relation to what would have been affixed? Did it mean anything or any evidence of that? Um, that's a good question. No, I, it's a, whether or not it's specific to Cardona, no, I don't think so. I think particularly in some of the, um, more so in, in Britain, I want to say, actually, we have quite we have evidence of like eyes sockets being quite deeply drilled and things. So there's always the suggestion that some gems would have been used there. On the um, Drum Cliff Cross, there's a really, really strange hole bored through a rot about at about this point, and it's kind of at a diagonal. You can sort of just about put a pencil through it, which seems to be deliberate. But it, there's only one of them, so you don't know what that quite what that's about. What would have been affixed there, or how? But I think this idea that um, other materials might have been affixed, whether permanently or um, maybe for to the celebration of certain feasts in the same way that somebody talked about this morning and a, a, a triptych a altarpiece being opened out in certain days of the year. Um, so perhaps that we can think about too. Um, yeah, so gems and metalwork, but no, there's no particular evidence for it, have, for what it would have been. Um, it's just a suggestion that that quite deeply and very specifically bored hole that appears to have been worked around with regards to the carving, um, possibly was for something like that. Thank you. Thanks. I, I'm wondering if, if um, the tower cross at Kells might be 
of interest to compare because it, it, I think it's the only one with Christ on the shaft of a cross. Um, yeah. Yeah, which is interesting. It's quite rare. Yeah, there's the crucifixion loo as well. Christ, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, that is a cross that I think has the names Columba and Patrick on it. And yeah. Sometimes called the Cross of St. Columba and yeah. Patrick. So mm -hmm. I'm just wondering if that might have a link in uh, it being a Columban. Mm. Uh, monastery and having a link to St. Patrick as well. But yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I, I think that maybe there's a possibility that uh, kinds of uh, interlace are copied from maybe quite ancient mm. monuments on the same site or nearby. So they don't have to be contemporary, do they? Mm, yeah. So that there's a deliberate copying of something which is, which is revered and then maybe... So, uh, yeah. you know, the late dating could be right if they're, d they're following a tradition locally, I suppose. Yeah, know. yeah, exactly. So, and the yeah. other point about that is, um, maybe, it's, maybe it's not about that, but the other point that I, I think is worth making is that in terms of interpreting this three-part ribbon in, in terms of the Trinity, um, is that maybe not everybody who looked at it will have realised that, that I think that we have to always remember that there can be layers of... Um, layers of reading depending on what a person knows or what sorts of texts they have been, they've read or um, engaged with. Um, the people will engage with and understand what they're seeing in different ways at all the time. So I think that's important too that even this um, tripartite form might have you know, pre-existed Christianity but it doesn't mean that the Christians then weren't understanding it in a very specific way. I think that's an important point to make as well. A little observation um, with that very wide ribbon, mm. the dividing it into to three gives it a sense of interlace. Where if without that, it would look more like just just a checker pattern. So <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. There's some very interesting sort of pillar stones around it, aren't there? Yeah. I've always wondered about them. They're rather uh, they're rather interesting. Uh, I think one's got a man holding a big fish and. Uh, I've never been able to figure them out whether they're the same date. Have you got any idea? Yeah, any I think, well, they do the same um, stylized type of figure carved on them. And yeah, I think yeah. with one has a harp and um, yeah. I think one has carries a book. Um, I think they're often interpreted in, in, in terms of David, King David, um, and this rewriting of the Psalms and the music. Um, and I think that's possibly as like, which also might add to ideas about kingship that Cynthia was talking about as well. Um, if they, I mean, at the moment they are displayed together, which makes it very tempting to understand. Sorry, there's two little things either side of this under the shed that have figures carved in each of the faces um, that I didn't, I chose not to talk about today to try and keep it to the 25 minutes. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so I think it, it's tempting given that they're presented together today to interpret them in that way, but we're, but I guess we can't be sure either that they, that that would have been how they were either produced or used. Um, yeah, but it's certainly interesting think we're thinking about those objects as well. That's interesting about David. There have been, been lots of attempts to associate patronage of high crosses with kings uh, as well as uh, churchmen. Yeah. So I wonder if they're, they're who the who the candidates are, you know, for mm. in that in that time. But, yeah. Uh, I don't know my kings. <laughs> <laughs> No. Yeah. But, uh, are there any any more questions? It's been fantastic. Here we go. Thank you, Mike. Um, having seen the Cross of Kong the other day and several other uh, wonderful pieces in the Gold Room uh, in Dublin uh, at the museum, I, I I'm struck by the the central hole as possibly possibly have been uh, a receptacle for for a relic, yeah. uh, which obviously would not be left outdoors for long periods of time, but only brought out at certain certain times. Uh, so that would be the first part of my question. And the other the other uh, question, part of my question would be that if this is a, indeed is a later date, 8th or 9th century, uh, would the more primitive shape been an attempt by the by the sculptors by the sculptors who uh, reference back to an earlier time, in other words, uh, to imitate earlier crosses in, in an attempt to, to put themselves closer to St. Patrick's time. Yeah, exactly. I think both things are absolutely um, right. Uh, this idea that, I think as I said, that um, whatever might have been affixed might have been for specific occasions. And I think the other thing we have to remember is that these crosses um, 
had lots and lots of varieties of functions um, and they would have been used in different ways, so perhaps even for um, kinds of uh, pilgrimage routes on specific feast days and things and perhaps even ser um, services or particular orders taking place in front of or before them or around them. Um, so I think that's really important, the idea that they would have been actually um, a player in those ceremonies, that a, their relic might have been added and taken away and so on is, is a really useful idea as well. Um, and the other thing you said, yes, about emulating, I think the, the primary thing for me is the geology and that I think the sculptor was working with the stone, it's a, you know, the relatively local stone um, that they had, uh, that had been quarried. And, but yes, absolutely, I think that idea that, um, of using styles and techniques um, that allowed them to reference and suggest a slightly uh, greater antiquity for themselves and their site is, is something else that, that we can uh, imagine is going on here too. Okay, well, thank you for sharing your scholarship with us. Thank you, thanks for having me. And, uh, <laughs>